Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. I hope you all had a great 4th of July weekend. Um, and you didn't eat anything that I wouldn't eat at all those picnic events that you went to and that sort of thing. So as usual, I have a few announcements and one of them is next week on July 13th, I'm doing a free workshop on, um, on the gut microbiome and the role of probiotics in repairing it. And all you have to do to sign up is to send me an email at pampopper at msn.com. I'll get you registered for the event and send you call-in inf information and that sort of thing. So take advantage of that. There's so much new research on the gut microbiome and it has such profound implications for health. Um, and for some of you that have never been on a live call with me, it would give, give us a chance to talk back and forth instead of just me talking into the camera and you watching this the week after we film it. Um, another thing that I want to mention to you is we're video streaming um, our monthly dinner here. So if you've never watched our monthly event where we bring in people from the community who can ask questions, I go through a slide presentation, um, the video stream service really, really works well. And all you have to do is, um, is send me an email. I'll forward it to the person in the office. Let's just have all the emails coming to me. And my email address is pampopper at msn.com. And um, you can get signed up to watch it for free. Now, you won't get the food. We can't feed you virtually, but you can at least watch the interaction. I always repeat the questions and you can ask questions. We always have somebody sitting there taking emails from people like you that might be watching this from all over the world. We have several thousand subscribers to this channel. So uh, take advantage of that. And, um, and then the other two things I'll mention real quickly is we have a couple weeks left with the annual pass program, uh, which is um, uh, an opportunity to save a couple thousand dollars on wellness form programs. So if you're interested in taking a lot of our classes, um, get in touch with me, send me an email, I can send you some information. All right, so today's topic, um, the relationship between inflammation and cancer. That's the one I'm gonna start with. It's been known for some time that inflammation increases the risk of cancer and can accelerate the, can the progression of cancer as well. Uh, cancer is often develops at the sites where infection, chronic inf and irritation or inflammation have occurred. Inflammation is actually a normal response. People tend to think it's always bad. It's really not always bad, but it's the way that the body defends itself against injury and the invasion of bacteria and viruses. The inflammatory response assists with tissue repair and regeneration and the elimination of viruses and bacteria. Swelling, heat, redness, pain, all common signs of inflammation. Now there's some evidence that in some cases inflammation can even prevent cancer. And this is thought to be due to the increased immune surveillance resulting from inflammation that leads to increased identification and targeting and elimination of cancer cells. Inflammation in response to injury or infection usually resolves pretty quickly, but sometimes inflammation can become chronic, and it is chronic inflammation that causes the problem. So a little bit of inflammation, your body, you're counting on your body's ability to mount an inflammatory response in order for you to stay healthy and alive, but when it's chronic, then it becomes a problem. Chronic inflammation is caused by a lot of different factors, which include obesity, repeated infections, irritants, diet, parasites. The longer inflammation persists, the higher the risk of cancer. The most common inflammatory conditions that increase risk are inflammatory bowel disease, which increases the risk of colon cancer, esophageal reflux leading to Barrett's esophagus, hepatitis leading to liver cancer, schizmo, uh, schizosomiasis leading to increased risk of bladder and colon cancer, and chronic H. pylori, which can increase the risk of stomach cancer. It's estimated that as much as 15 to 25 percent, depending on the area of the world, of cancers are a result of chronic inflammation and viral and bacterial infections. So this is definitely something we should pay attention to. There are several mechanisms for the relationship between inflammation and cancer. Chronic inflammation can create an environment that is favorable to lesions and tumors and initiation. The presence of infection, which can cause inflammation, can result in increased production of free radicals. These free radicals then cause oxidative stress, which can uh, create a friendly environment that promotes the survival of initiated cells, the first step in the development of tumors. Long-term or repeated infection and extensive injury can increase cell death, and then the replacement of those cells requires increased production of undifferentiated precursor cells like tissue stem cells. Persistent inflammation can result in unfavorable changes in the body's ability to properly regulate stem cell production, leading to the growth of cancer. 
Inflammation also can promote abnormal cell proliferation, resistance to programmed cell death, increased angiogenesis, and more potential for metastasis. Now, while preventing cancer and other degenerative diseases requires comprehensive strategies, addressing inflammation is an important one of those. Adopting a plant-based diet can reduce inflammation in several ways. Animal foods contain a high amount of arachidonic acid, which can increase inflammation through numerous pathways, one of which is increasing the production of inflammatory prostaglandins that lead to an inflamed state. Reducing or eliminating animal foods can reduce inflammation levels. Obesity leads to increased inflammation because fat cells produce inflammatory molecules. Adopting a plant-based diet can assist with weight loss, which can in turn then reduce inflammation. Plant-based diets are high in fiber, which has been shown to reduce inflammation through interaction with the gut microbiome. I'm sure everybody knows this, but antibiotics have an adverse effect on the gut microbiome. While antibiotics are overprescribed by doctors, a much more pernicious source of exposure to antibiotics is eating conventionally grown animal foods. Um, and the, there is no question, nobody even tries to deny anymore, that 75% or more of the antibiotics produced in the United States are injected into farm animals living in confinement facilities. So when you eat these types of foods, you're actually taking in antibiotics orally and damaging the gut microbiome. Well, when you change the, the composition and function of the gut bacteria, you end up with altered immunity, which in turn can result in increased susceptibility to infections and other conditions that cause inflammation. Now, taking probiotics can restore beneficial gut bacteria, reduce inflammation, and can help to prevent and treat infections. And so, hence, we're going to have that workshop next week. We're going to talk a little bit about these types of things. So avoid conventionally raised animals and farmed fish and reserve antibiotic use only for situations in which there is absolutely no other alternative. And that would be a whole lot less antibiotic prescribing and taking than we do right now in this country. And you can break the cycle of chronic infections. Most people can break the cycle of, of continued and chronic infections. Well-structured plant-based diets reduce the risk of cancer in other ways, too. Uh, plant foods contain concentrated amounts of antioxidants, which can counter the oxidative stress induced by poor diets, inflammation, and infection. These diets also eliminate cancer-promoting foods like dairy products, which increase uh, IGF-1 levels, insulin-like growth factor 1 levels, a known risk for cancer. It's not possible to avoid all inflammation, and I could, in fact, go on. This uh, article has uh, 16 references, and I could go on and give you 250 more pretty easily. But, um, but the fact is that when inflammation is just a healing response to infection or injury, that's good. When it's chronic, not good. And a lot of people in our country, because of their poor diets and because of their, um, uh, their, their weight status and that sort of thing, live in a chronic state of inflammation, which increases the risk of a lot of things, including cancer. And one key to all of this is the gut microbiome, which we're going to talk about next week. So um, the other topic I wanted to cover today, and this is a little quicker topic, and I, I just can't even believe this. Um, the FDA has just approved a new obesity treatment. It's called the Aspire Assist device. Made by Aspire Bariatrics, the device allows patients to remove up to 30% of stomach contents after eating. In order to use it, patients have to chew their food really, really well so that the uh, contents of the stomach will go through the tiny little tube. The company's website says that this results in meals taking as much as two times the normal time to eat, and a combination of removing the stomach contents and taking additional time to eat results in weight loss. Now, in order to use the device, patients have a tube placed endoscopically into the stomach and a port valve placed outside the body. About 20 to 30 minutes after eating, the patient attaches the system to the port and empties the stomach contents directly into the toilet. Water from a reservoir flushes out the tube and the device is placed back into a handy-dandy portable case, which makes it easy to gorge and purge almost anywhere. The whole process just takes 5 to 10 minutes. The company's website features studies using the unit. Two of the studies were really small. A third one that included 111 patients was the basis for FDA approval. In this study, 51 patients had the procedure to facilitate using the device along with some instruction on diet and lifestyle modification. 
60 patients then served as controls. Those in the treatment group lost an average of 12.1% of their body weight versus the controls who only lost 3.6% of their body weight at the end of a year. Um, both groups showed, showed a little bit of improvement in conditions like diabetes and hypertension, and both groups reported improved quality of life. Four intervention patients had serious events which include parad included peritonitis, abdominal pain, ulceration, and tube replacement. The target market is obese people who've been unable to lose weight with non-surgical options. Patients are, used to, are advised to use the device two to three times a day until they get close to their goal weight and then start tapering. I looked really hard, but I couldn't find any studies on the drug makers or on the device makers website or anyplace else showing that anybody has ever gotten to their goal weight or close to their goal weight using this device. Common side effects, indigestion, nausea, vomiting, constipation, diarrhea, risks, pain, abdominal bloating, infection, inflammation of the abdominal lining, sores in the stomach, pneumonia, puncture of the stomach, and death. Sometimes the tube has to be removed due to the hardening or inflammation of the skin at the site of the tube placement or migration of the device into the stomach wall. I just, I, this is just incomprehensible to me. The FDA is certainly excited about it in spite of the risks and lack of proven track record for achieving and maintaining significant weight loss. According to William Meisel, uh, he's the Deputy Director for Science and Chief Scientist at the FDA's Center for Devices and Radiological Health, this is a quote, the Aspire Assist approach helps provide effective control of calorie absorption, which is a key principle of weight management therapy. What? A key principle of weight management is controlling calorie absorption? This guy's a medical doctor. What world is he living in? The key strategies that lead to, lead to weight loss, not management, you know, obese people don't want to manage their overweight status. They want to get rid of that weight. The key strategies are getting to the root cause of the eating disorder, changes in thinking patterns, learned new skills, and developing new habits. I can't fathom how draining the stomach context, the contents accomplishes any of those things. But evidence and even common sense are not part of the FDA approval process. The FDA's 2015 performance report shows that the agency's approval for high-risk medical devices was 98%. The approval rate for lower risk devices, 85%. The FDA also reported significant decreases in the amount of time required for approval. For high risk devices, it went from 432 days in 2013 down to 262 days in 2014. For lower risk devices, even more, uh, even shorter, an average of 95 days. This led one analyst to write, quote, the improvement in the FDA regulatory process may encourage new investment in the medical device industry in the United States, especially by companies and investors. This is all great for manufacturers and investors, but what about consumers? I've said for a while now, someday, I really think this is going to happen if we keep going this direction. Drug companies and device makers are just going to send a memo to the FDA and say, hey, we're just giving you a heads up. We're putting something new in the market. You're probably going to get some adverse reports. We'll probably kill a few people. Just you know, wanted to let you know in advance. I mean, when 98% of the submissions are approved, and for drugs, it's like 94%, at some point, going through the process won't be... Uh, needed at all. So, it, you know, it reinforces the need for patient education. Uh, the government agencies and medical associations to which it, Americans have trusted their health have really abandoned interest in public health and they're really only interested in protecting and promoting the interests of drug and device makers. Um, so I'm still astounded. I, I read this article a few weeks ago and I thought I've, I've got to do something um, about this because I, we've really gone to the theater of the absurd here in the medical profession. So um, just a couple things. Some of you write to me and ask me how do you get in touch with Wellness Farm Health if you want to call and chat with our folks. We're open from 9 o'clock to 9 p.m. Monday through Thursday, 9 to 5 on Friday. Those are Eastern times here in the U.S. The number is 614-841-7700. My email address, pampopper at msn.com. Please feel free to get in touch with us. would love to have you in some classes. Take my, um, my class next week on the microbiome. I think you'll enjoy it. All right, that's all for today. Pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I will be back to you next week with more news.